welcome to another edition of the Sea Battle Royale. Ha <laughs> ha, my name is Dawkins, and this is episode 19. The Sleeper Has Awakened. Irrelevant coalitions, sleeping giants wake, and wars fought good. Starting on turn 281, let's get right into this. Welcome, one and all, to another episode of the Civilization Battle Royale. After a hiatus, 37 rebooted parts, another long hiatus, and another 18 parts, for a total time of just shy of three years to the day, this is user XRock once again stepping in for a narration. It's good to be back. Let's get into it. The real story coming into this week, the big southern African powerhouse everyone has been expecting finally woke up. How much damage will they do? I'm going to guess all of it. All the damage. Varian's hand-drawn map with the quickness as usual. The last free bits of snowy land are filling in at a rate that is finally overtaking the raising of cities, and a few nations with large areas of land have opted to increase their city density. Keen eyes have noted that Seku was retaken from the Quikuro by Uruguay. Relevance is the name of the game. Can you into it? This is the Spore map by user Thy Reformer. Thanks for doing it. Survey says we pulled 100 people for the PR, and guess who's number one? It's Uruguay again. We open with the Apache and Metis clash in the American Midwest, Frog Lake being pillaged and surrounded. A strong complement of crossbows, led by a healthy force of four Corsairs, the Enlightenment-era horseback unit, by the way, has already brought it down to the yellow, and their chances look good. The Métis make a push of their own into... <laughs> making some noise, just like I made, but it may not end well as Apache reinforcements in the area flank around them. On to the Quikoro iroquois conflict in the Caribbean, where Itzkahiti has been decimated. Iroquois captured it since it was last seen last part, and the Quikoro recaptured it before the end of the part, leaving it undetected on the end of part map makers. But this may be the final flip, as Quikoro's naval force is cut off, outnumbered, and outgunned. Iware's troops retake Echo, a long corsair making its way into the city, and a couple of pikemen knock at the gates of Awahimi. King Pai, actually that's how it's pronounced, I'm, I made sure to check, seems unconcerned with the loss of these gains, focusing his few melee units in the region on the push to Udo. Finding that their colors look really good in the frozen north, the Kazakhs continue onwards, trying to make the Nanets not actually exist like the rumors say they don't. Salia Harad flips from 20 to 10 to 5, and likely to 2 as the assault advances. I think that's like a, a numbers chart. Ablai Khan also makes an interesting move, offering support in a coalition war with a Yupik against Korea. And by offering support, I mean taking them right into a trap. Kazakh units will not be participating in this theater of war. The exclave of Napayarak is scarcely garrisoned and isolated, and the only route for Yupik units is a one-tile gap between Haida territory that is also a one-tile island, blocking naval support completely. A contingent of land units make their way through the Korean borders, likely to be slaughtered. Calgary is captured and set ablaze again, although Canada will have one last chance later in the turn to save it slash delay it inevitable. Louis Rial seems intent on burning down the last of these Canadian-founded cities, and certainly dedicated forces to this area can do it. We'll see if he looks to finish the job afterwards. An impromptu scout con 2210 Hudson's Bay breaks out as New Zealand scouts have found their way through open borders with the Iroquois to witness this event, and bumps into a possibly trapped Kazakh scout. Prussia repairs what they can in Bergen and shuffles their navy around a bit, but with no new land units in sight, it seems Frederick is prepared to lose their foothold across the sea. 
A navy can retake a city, but against the land army the Vikings are marching in, it will not hold. Only further demolish the city. Venice and Beta Israel join the dogpile on Nidongo, and Korea and Haiti declare on Papua? I don't see any of them making it to a relevant status. Sorry, Thy. Viking reinforcements make their way across the waters as the Manx Crossbow Corps have Port Erin surrounded. It won't be taken by land, but that embarked knight can make it around the coast next turn. Haida and Maratha join in on Papua, still not likely to be relevant. Oh, Maratha, maybe. But that does have Korea and Haida fighting on the same side. Maybe that will have further repercussions for the Yupik. Nubia and Nadongo also start up a coalition against Parthia. Huh. And I think I know who rounded up the irrelevant supporters. Tangu declares on Parthia as well, followed by the nation seeking to do most of the conquering here, the Goths. Parthia's core is depleted from fighting in the mountains to the south for hundreds of years, and Alaric wishes to ride in those northern fields and fertile desert floodplains. The troops aren't on the front lines yet, but heavy reserves in the north and a much stronger production base should see the units draped in black charging in soon. The Sulu declare on Australia, trying to take advantage of their more powerful navy in the region. Though the power rankings gap is vast, this war is somewhat evenly matched, for now. Tech counts are even, and overall military is fairly even, but Sulu is densely packed and fielding privateers, while Australia is spread thin across the empire. So while they hold the advantage for now on the push for those islands, Wyala already in the yellow, Australia's more than double production will turn things around in due time. The Puppet Master is revealed as Sedan declares on both of his most threatening neighbors, Australia and Papua. Likely responsible for dragging the irrelevant coalition into the Papua War, the Moors also join in. Seeing as it's only Sulu and New Zealand against Australia, that could have been suggested by either party, but is mutually beneficial anyway. Attacking the Aussie Empire from both sides. A little Aussie sandwich. Uh, what is it? Vegemite? A Vegemite sandwich. Disgusting. However, picking both fights at the same time may be too much on their plate. Madagascar joins the Parthia war wagon, though. As do the Kazakhs. Sharing borders, they too could make gains like the Goths in this region, if they can divert some forces from erasing the Nanets. We'll have to see who gets units to the area first. A nice carpet in the Moors core, which is fun to say, though North Africa is still looking a little sparse. Korea and Shikoku make peace. Frog Lake remains in the yellow, recovers and cut knife gets scratched by a wave of advancing Apache ranged units. This front is going to be a bloody grind. The Vikings take Bergen and Prussia bombards the city to the black. Unfortunately, as we all know, surrounding cities with ranged units like Gellius's, Gellii, make it rather difficult to capture even with melee galleons in range. The Manx and Vikings skirmish in the North Seas as Jelling is founded once again after being raised last part. Poor Czech scout, trapped in an unclaimed border bubble. The Sulu press onwards, Wyala down to the red and Newcastle down a quarter. Minimal Aussie reinforcements thus far, so hmm, this could be looking good for the Sulu. Madagascar's joining of the coalition is not irrelevant, as their supposed peacekeepers around Nizwa go hostile and chip away at the city. Were it not for Palmyra also playing peacekeeper and taking up space, this would be much more swift. But no, the populace will suffer for another turn or two before over half of them are wiped out. The Manx get some relief as peace is brokered with the HRE, allowing them to focus on the Vikings. Port Erin still stands under the orange banner, though melee units are on approach. Tonga and Uruguay and the Golden Horde and Parthia also make peace. That's nice. The Goths reach the front, but Parthia has summoned up a defense of mostly crossbowmen only a step behind. Kazakh units trickle in from the north as they piece out a couple irrelevant wars with Palmyra and Nepal. 
Over in North America, the Métis city of Frog Lake falls to the Apache, where they will be kissed and turned into chiefs, or something. The Goths also get a division through the open borders with Muscovy and begin to threaten Frankfurt on der Oder. Nizhny Novgorod is also the site of a large class with semi forces, which could go either way. Yeah, and I know I've probably mispronounced the Frankfurt city. I'm sorry. It's it's just I'm an American. Nepal didn't see that war as irrelevant and give up a city in their Kazakh peace deal. Uh, if Able can get the production under control or get some troops over to the new exclave of Patan, it could serve as a great flanking base in an eventual war with the Kamakhanate. Masangano Falls, pushing Nadongo further out of the southern parts of Africa, and a bunch of civilian units escape into the ocean. Next up for Zimbabwe, the capital, Kabasa. Uruguay still can't make progress outside of coastal Seku, which the Kwikoro push back on and bring it to the red. Nubia pieces out with Benin, freeing them up to redirect forces to the south into Nadongo, surrounding Kavanga, and bringing the walls down. Nzinga's core is crumbling, and she may be kicked off the mainland soon enough. Two turns later, and the Parthian exclave of Nijwa falls as predicted. Madagascar's foothold on the mainland grows, and with no more opposition in the area, now is the time to eye a new target, keep the momentum going. India's new holdings on the Horn look sparse for now, but a land army makes their way across the sea from their core. Who will strike first? You were not prepared. New Zealand's double war sets off on a misstep, as their recently integrated capture of Adelaide looks set to fall back to its original owners. And if Blizzard decides to resurrect Illidan once more, I'm open for voice work. A look at the now-at-peace nubia benin borders show Nubia managed to retake Echo and barely held Oahimi while Benin successfully defends Udo, protecting a major production center from crumbling and preserving their future opportunities. The Tongan core is looking a little empty, and all that water doesn't provide much production to pump out units, but their military strength is quite high for their low power ranking, and you know as the saying goes, water water everywhere, so let's all have a drink. We've seen some rather large navy groups roaming about early last part, and with peace made with Uruguay a couple turns ago, I believe their sole remaining war is with the Sulu, likely sending that navy north around Papua. Shikoku makes real progress since we last saw them, landing a significant army thanks in part to open borders with the Qin, and with cannons set up, Hangzhou is in very real danger of being flipped. The Qing navy lying in wait can easily retake it, but allowing cities to be decimated is not a winning strategy. I'm honestly not sure what we're seeing here, but I believe this is Calgary being founded anew upon its ashes by that settler two tiles away that has appeared to have not moved yet, judging by the borders not appearing yet, so there. The last of the Canadian army dissipates under Métis assault, and Windsor has almost finished burning, but WLMK refuses to give up. I don't know what he expected from declaring this war. The Vikings in Prussia have been playing hot potato with Bergen, and it is reduced to a minimal population but it appears Prussia may hold the territory as the remaining Viking melee units are scarce and several turns away. Sulu's northern Australian campaign starts well, taking both Wyala and Newcastle and running the Australian navy off. Tangu thinks they have an opening and strike at Sulu with the meager forces stationed in their exclave of Bamo. I believe these are galleons and ships of the line unleashing upon the ports of Dungan and Geelong. Geelong, Geelong, whatever it is. Jamalal has enough privateers nearby that this attack should be repelled, but we may see a city flip. 
The Benin advance continues. Kavanga falls and is set ablaze, and a small naval regiment softens up the offshore Mapongo Anadongo, suggesting to Nzinga that she maybe want to seek her exile in one of her further flung colonies. Parthia summons a defensive force to fight its northern aggressors, but are far too late to save Zadrakarta, surrounded by Kazakhs and in the yellow. The fertile fields around Turkestan in the peaceful Kazakh core have allowed it to blossom to a massive 42 population. What is that, an island sieve? The Avenks core and Kamak border. Both sides are a little light on the melee units here. I count seven Avenks to the Khanate's eight, but several of those Avenk melee units are in the back lines. If war did break out here, it would likely be a bloody ranged war with few city captures. Looks like Tongu brought some irrelevant friends to the Sulu War, though. I guess Rajapapua really wanted those North Aussie Islands, because despite being engaged with New Zealand to the east, Papua joins Tongu in this fight with a slightly technologically superior and manpower-ready Sulu to the west. This may be a critical overextension that has significant repercussions. Well, so much for an Antarctic colony escape for Nzinga as Uruguay makes quick work of the tiny islands. Despite the losses, Nzinga can have a moment of respite as she begs for mercy from Benin and gets it. Geelong has flipped and Dungan may do the same, but the Bamo Battalion is running out of steam and will not make any permanent gains. Damage has been done, but now the question is, can they hold on to Bamo itself? To the north, we see some of the fighting along the border to the Tongu mainland, where Sulu forces hold strong for now. Tongu appears to be in the process of upgrading their trebuchets to cannons, while Sulu already field field guns, the Enlightenment-era mod upgrade, in mass. Northeastern Papua is under heavy assault, not just from New Zealand, from both the north and south, but determined to prove they can be relevant, Haida sends a navy contingent across the ocean threatening both Vabukori and Elevala. Sadan's push from the south has almost surrounded Borera and looks like it will succeed. The sharpest of eyes and memory will notice that the Iroquois have founded a city of their own on the island two tiles east of Ishkahidi, which now used to have a holy site on it. Zimbabwe advances. Kabasa crumbles. I see seven Nadongo melee units left, and as they die, so do Nzinga's chances of surviving. The Antarctic colonies are gone. Will Uruguay come try to get an African foothold? Because that would be cool, like Chile 2.0. Chile from Mark 1, that is. Songhai also joins the Parthian Irrelevant Coalition. The Qing repel the Shikoku forces, and the capture of Hangzhou is now in doubt, despite the city being at zero HP. The embarked musketmen could land, but being unfortified in open terrain at two-thirds health would likely be dead before they could act next turn. Will Shishi push back? The end is near. Windsor is gone. Calgary is captured and burning again. Kasigluk is at half health, with three matey ships surrounding it. Prime your Fs. I haven't been reading the titles, but... X-Rock has been doing really good. Like, this one's called Cruisin' Papua, which I'm assuming is a reference to Cruisin' USA, the arcade game, which I sunk a lot of money into as a kid. Anyway, on the southern Papua front, we see Boera taking another hit, and the mainland coastal city of Darwin also takes damage. Papua's navy appears to be mostly frigates, so that lack of melee ships may be an issue if anything flips. You know, aside from the loss of millions of lives from these massive cities. New Zealand shows what is, I believe, the cylinder's first cruiser in the bottom center of this slide. Nice. Kiwi Navy is good. Also, if you want to see more of the titles of these slides, you can go to the, uh, the official page, the official link, and all the slides, all the titles will be there. I'm sorry I haven't pronouncing them, but it, it affects transitions and... Yeah. Sorry. Kabasa falls, and Nzinga retreats to Kandonga. Two Razi warriors, Zimbabwe's pikemen unique unit, stand near death on the front lines, ready to die to make it so the entire Nadongo population is wiped out. 
Zajrakarta is taken by the Kazakhs, but Parthia's defenders have managed to prevent damage to other frontline cities so far. Ragas, or Rages, or however you call it, specifically is a surprise, but the hills surrounding the city protect it from the goth crossbowmen on flat terrain behind it. A shot confirming the capture of the Nadongo Antarctic colonies, the Uruguayan ships settling in to repair and defend the new territory. A keen eye on the mini-map will see Adelaide has returned to Australia. Toussaint must be hitting the rum cause he must think he's Captain Morgan. Not with a two ship assault you're not. Oh, it was a distraction for an equally drunk declaration of war. Yeah, the Western Zimbabwe Corps is a little sparse with all the fighting in the East, but Ranavalano forgot to move troops to the front before declaring war. So that advantage is gone. And that's all you had. A notification indicates Nadongo managed to retake their capital. But not for long, as Zimbabwe takes their turn capturing it again, likely for good. Madagascar's African foothold of Fihaonana hmm, is the first city to take damage in this conflict. Matamba has finished burning, freeing up a large hole in the middle of Zimbabwe's core. Minimap watch, Adelaide falls back to New Zealand. New Zealand extends, or perhaps overextends, along the south coast to assault Wollongong to fight that Wollongong navy. Sure, the ships could flip a city, but with no land army defense, it will just be lost back. Speaking of which, Adelaide flips back. Does Ragnar have his shit together? I think Ragnar got his shit together. A well-balanced navy escorting a land army makes its way north around the Isles, taking Colby and thrashing on Chan, with plenty of steam to move onwards to Kirkpatrick and Balasala when he's done. The Manx navy is looking a little outdated, so this could be rough. The Shikoku Homeland. An almost full carpet. Hopefully they have similar density of units to the east fighting the Qing. Kochi might be the first capital to reach 40 pop featured in a slide, but the Haida capital of Ninstins was 41 as of the end of last part. Korea makes peace with the Avanks. They're still at war with the Yupik, though. Not that you could tell by any damage, despite being in range of each other. Having depleted their forces in the region, flipping Bergen to a crisp, the Vikings are now on the back foot as Frederick has sent an army across the sea. Raskilde, after having been citadeled right up to the gates for centuries, finally looks set to exchange hands, and Ragnar may not be able to take it back. Back in the north, Parthia, the invaders continue their assaults. The Goths see little progress from the back line, crossbowmen, but a trebuchet up front may start getting work done. The Kazakhs, on the other hand, flow into the land like water. Curassairs looking to surround Almady, and a couple of trebuchets have set up north of Tessaphon, bombarding away. Press A to pay respects. The king is dead. Long live the king. Kasagluk falls and is set ablaze. Canada's chances of retaking it are slim to none, and their chances of planting that settler aren't much better. I don't think planting a fourth Calgary on the same spot for the third time will work out. The F's were primed, and now we must release them. Farewell, William Lyon Mackenzie King. So long, eh? Madagascar better be regretting the decisions that led to this war because, oof, their navy almost completely gone, Zimbabwe surrounds Fionana unhindered and brings it to half. That's probably a wonder in the center of the slide, but I have no idea what it is. The Avanks and the Kamakanate declare an irrelevant coalition war against the Golden Horde. Or Bambagor just really wants this Golden Horde composite bowman to stop crowding his borders. The Big Buying Theory Oh, see, that's why not settling your surrounding area on all sides can be a problem. Eventually, it becomes a front line. Tongu fights their way in and surrounds the Sulu capital of Baeng. Remaining units scramble to defend, but it may be too late. Nadongo reclaims its capital again. 
Uruguay decides to try something else other than marching into the jungle and instead sends boats to a jungle island. But it's working, and Koagupe falls to the red. It's been a slow go, but La Vieja refuses to be stalemated. When are they going to make peace, damn it? Anchan falls, and Kirkpatrick is well below half. The Vikings are on a roll. Can they keep it up? Manx territory looks rather empty. Dare I say yes? Australia rallies back in the north, reclaiming Newcastle and pelting Bunbury to have health with ranged attacks. They also lost and reclaimed Adelaide again a few slides back, but Fs are more important. The southern Sulu cities are sparsely defended, yet a trio of field guns advance on Bamo. Hopefully they have a melee unit with them off screen to the west, or it's a wasted effort. The Zimbabwe Corps. A little light on units in the middle, but winning productive wars on the borders. Fuonana in the red, I just love saying it, and Kabasa in full black, so all is well. And Zavgombe is another massive landlocked desert floodplain city at 42 population. Nadongo has five melee units remaining, and Benin has dropped two citadels over the last few turns north and northeast of Kendongo, stealing another four tiles and putting borders on the walls of the city. Forget Vabakori and Elavala. Haida goes for the bigger city and in possibly the first real snipe of the Seabricks, takes Boera from under the nose of Sedan. It seems like they are the successors of the Blackfoot when they are sniping. It may not hold, but that is, I believe, the biggest distance from home capture, beating the old champion of Venezuela taking old Port Erin. Chavez will not be happy to hear that bit of news reported back to him, with a second witness confirming it. In the bottom left corner, 30 Pop Darwin is in the red. New Zealand putting that new cruiser to work. The Manx push back a bit, recapturing Onchan and scattering Ragnar's naval assault. The path to new Port Erin is clear and the city is at low health. Perhaps that can be reclaimed as well. Maratha, complete a wonder. Blue cassette, fill us in please. Dawkins' note, that would be the Facile Gebi, a defensive wonder which improves the combat strength of nearby friendly units and gives plus 9 defense to the city as well as a minor engineering bonus. A few Sulu range units have already set up to start firing when their capital falls, but it may not be enough with only one melee ship in the immediate vicinity. They do, however, retake Newcastle. And Madagascar loses their foothold on southern Africa as Fionana falls. They need peace, pronto, and some time to rebuild their military. That ideology notification is, I'm told, Zimbabwe choosing autocracy. As if they choose anything else after the blood spilled last part and here. It should be marked that the Iroquois have gone autocracy, Zimbabwe have gone autocracy, and Uruguay, I believe, has gone order. Speaking of Uruguay, they aren't satisfied with the Antarctic colonies and come to check out Africa, taking Mapongo on Nadongo. Zimbabwe rains hell on Kabasa, but a melee unit is still turns away. The Kazakhs expansion continues, taking Tesafon, though it may flip a few times. Like Salia Harad again, apparently it flipped a couple of turns back. The push on Almaty appears to be being repelled, and the Goths continue to have no luck in Ragus. Rages. I like calling it Rages. A line of Apache explorers explore a little close to a certain mountain range on the edge of Antarctica. That's weird. They don't appear on any maps. Venice gets a cannon around the mountain in position to reach Bursa, only to be met by a Turkish cannon, a bombard. An argument over size mattering and what you do with it ensues for hours. Port Erin is reclaimed by the Manx as the Chin and Canton end hostilities. Nizhny Novgorod is set ablaze as unhappiness is still a problem in Grandma Eadni's lands. Long Muscovy is cut apart again. Vologda becoming an exclave. I like pronouncing that one. Vologda. Frankfurt on der Oder has survived the Goth backdoor squad, and Prussia now fields both line infantry and Enlightenment era mod 
gunpowder units and its upgrade, their unique unit, the Landwehr. Papua reclaims Boera, but the damage is done. 33 to 16 to 8. That is a hit to production. Raskilde flips like Bergen did all the way down to one population, but at least it has surrounding tiles again. Alibur also takes damage into the yellow as the blue wave surges west. That's right, hashtag blue wave 2020. The Tangu Navy takes Baing and attempts to hold a defensive perimeter as the aforementioned Sulu range units bombard the city. But I believe the one privateer southwest of the city without an icon in the middle of an animation is a Sulu vessel. So we shall see. Yep, so the Sulu recapture their capital for a moment but are still surrounded with little melee support to pull that off again should Tongu recapture, which they probably will. More success for Uruguay as they take Kahugupe, locking the Kwikoro in their jungles. Does La Vieja continue or know when to call it for a day? Uruguay also gets another wonder. Blue cassette? Dawkins' note, that would be the Crystal Palace, built by Heisenberg, I think. It provides plus 5% great person generation for each great work in the city, as well as three great work of art slots, which provide a theming bonus when from different civilizations. Sadan decides he wants Boera now, and so he takes it. Darwin has also flipped in the bottom left corner. Papua's navy spreads thinner. Korea finally advances on the Yupik exclave of Naparyaryak. A shot of the now peaceful Chin Canton border. Too bad we didn't see it during the war, but it doesn't look like much happened. Shikoku has pushed west from Ba'arin with a citadel and filled the land with units. Planning something, Sakamoto? Their North African carpet is starting to fill in. All the Moors need now is a target. North Oceania. A scattering of random boats and a small skirmish or two. A Papuan frigate is about to sink a Haitian galleon. We can see the New Zealand capture of Darwin, and they also flip Adelaide that turn, but lost it already. Australia's core is looking mighty empty. And Papua takes Darwin back. This gives Maratha an opportunity as a couple of galleons finally arrive to try to make relevance. Palmyra wants a piece of Parthia, too. The Sulu landing in Bamo goes well, a contingent making landfall in good condition, but something's missing. A melee unit. A ship of the line is nearby, but Bamo is not coastal. You just lost your capital again, Jamalal. This is not the time to be making rookie mistakes. Peace is made with Tonga. No Tonga time this week, folks. Zimbabwe takes Kabasa again, and now after Benin citadeling, Kindonga only has one land tile other than the city itself. Uruguay's ships blockade the ports as they celebrate another wonder at home, completing the Louvre. Only one melee unit remains outside of Kabasa, surrounded by Zimbabwe troops with their backs up against the Benin border. Back where we started this episode, a solid Apache frontline advances on Cut Knife. Seemingly enough to take the city, but we've seen this before. These early mid-game range units foiled by hills and forests, unable to hit the city despite being in range. More matey rebels between Duck Lake and Fort Gary. Where's Gary? Nazinga begs for mercy again and is granted. Zimbabwe is content to bow out with the capital, leaving Nadongo with but two tiles of land. The closing of borders has shunted their last remaining melee units south into the open lands from the burning of Matamba, but they stave off immediate destruction as a caravel fights out of the city and sinks the Uruguayan ship of the line that threatened to do so. The Goths and Prussia put it to rest, tired of fighting each other through Muscovy's lands. We see Geronimo claim the last bit of Greenland coast, planting Hakaye inland up against a mountain. A whole fleet of Haitian triremes attempt to mount a rescue mission, 
trying to save one in the far north trapped behind ice and Iroquois borders. Homeless scouts wander in the snow. One last look at northern Parthia and Tessaphon is reclaimed. The Kazakhs are looking depleted but still try for Almady. The Goths continue to flounder outside of rages, the city still undamaged or recovering to full every turn. It could be that the city has entered a rage and is now taking reduced damage from both piercing, bludgeoning, and slashing damage. Did they go bear totem? Could be even better. And we close out in northeast Papua where they reclaim a decimated Boera but it is not defended and continues to be vulnerable to flipping again. The New Zealand Navy also surrounds Elavala and the Haida are not done here yet, threatening Vabukori. A final examination of the minimap sees Viking recaptures of Raskilde and Port Erin and the taking of Kirkpatrick. Sorry, Manx. This has been a hell of a long part, but what a part it was. I had a blast. Hopefully it doesn't take three years to get to do this again. This is X-Rock signing out. And here I am, Dawkins, at the end of the part as usual. Uh, I'm going to use my little spiel and say thank you for watching. Yeah, how about that? Thanks for watching. Uh, if you are new to this, please like and subscribe. Really appreciate you being around. Check out the Discord. Check out the subreddit. Whichever you prefer, or hang out here in the comments on YouTube. That's cool, too. Um, it's been great having you, and I'm tired, so we're going to call it here. So, until we meet again, we'll see you next time.